So I'm Ivan Gaskell. I'm professor of cultural history and museum studies at Bard Graduate Center. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Laurel Kendall, our speaker today, and to moderate this discussion. I want to acknowledge that although this is obviously a Bard Graduate Center event from the ancestral lands of the Lene Lenape peoples on Manahata, I'm speaking to you from my home beside a trail now paved, used for many generations to connect the valleys of the Mississauk and the Musketaquid rivers, uniting communities of the Massachusett and Nipmuc peoples. I hold the land I occupy and from which I speak to you in Massachusetts in trust, just as others hold in trust the land in Southern Alberta where my father was born. Laurel Kendall with a bachelor's degree from Berkeley and a PhD from Columbia. Laurel Kendall is among our leading anthropologists concerned with Southeast Asia. She spent the greater part of her career uh, at the American Museum of Natural History, rising progressively through the curatorial ranks of the anthropology division to become its chair in 2009. Among her many, many contributions to scholarly service, she's been president of the Association for Asian Studies. And I want to single this one out, an elected member of the advisory board of the International Society for Shamanic Research. What Laurel doesn't know about Southeast Asian shamans in Korea and elsewhere isn't worth shaking a stick at or a rattle. She's been an honored guest in many universities in this country and abroad, most recently as distinguished visiting professor at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. In the long term, since 1995, she's been adjunct professor in the Department of Anthropology at Columbia University. Now, Laurel has published on Southeast Asia extensively, and I'd like to single out in particular her award-winning book, Shamans, Housewives, and Other Restless Spirits, Women in Korean Ritual Life, from the University of Hawaii Press. And about to appear this spring from the University of California Press is Mediums, Markets, and Magical Things, Statues, Paintings, and Masks in Asian Places. Now, I've had the privilege of working with Laurel on projects by successive postdoctoral fellows appointed jointly by Bard Graduate Center and the American Museum of Natural History. And Hadley Jensen is the current incumbent. Laurel is a most generous and spirited collaborator. I use the term spirited purposefully for the spirit world is never far from her consideration. And I have a feeling that this will be the case in the new work she's to present to us today under the title, Things Fall Apart, Material Religion and the Problem of Decay with examples from Korea, Vietnam and Myanmar. Over to Laurel Kendall, I'm so glad you're with us. And please uh, share your screen at your convenience. Thank you very much for that fulsome introduction, Ivan. And I want to say that in the process of writing the book that I will be having some more to say about in the talk, uh, the BGC community has been very important to me. The ideas that buzz in the seminars have just were, were very important and encouraging to me in, in the process of writing. All right, the title is Things Fall Apart. Things do fall apart, but they do so at, um, they do not do so at the same rate or in the same circumstance. Social implications of decay are many and diverse usually depressing, but not always. Uh, the question of decay figures in my forthcoming book, Mediums and Magical Things. This project involves images and the work they do in association with mediums or shamans in some different Asian places. It is a book about material stuff and about invisible entities, gods, spirits, energies, that sometimes go to ground in mediums, bodies, and in statues, paintings, and masks. I've worked with Korean shamans called Manchin beginning in the 1970s, thought a lot about purification and pollution in relation to shaman bodies and client bodies. 
but I didn't have much occasion to think about the images that hang above the Munchen's altar beyond understanding that these things were sacred objects and consequential for the Munchen's work. I did hear a story once about some paintings, old gods hung in the altar of a Munchen I call Yongsu's mother, and new gods inherited from another Munchen who had retired her practice. Yongsu's mother hung the paintings over the altar, um, of one over the other in her, in her narrow shrine room, and then things went badly for her. Uh, bad business, illness, and then the paintings fell to the floor and stuck together. They had been fighting, she said. Paintings fighting, gods fighting, some concatenation of the two. I left it at that for several years. Um, there was another MacGuffin for this project. Early in the new millennium, opportunity um, took me to Vietnam to work with the Vietnam Museum of Ethnology on a, an, a joint exhibit that would open at the American Museum of Natural History and close in Hanoi. For that project, the temple keepers of, of the Tian Hung Palace in Fuzai donated these carved wooden images to the Museum of Ethnology. One day, Madame Zuen, uh, the temple keeper, came to the museum and in anticipation of her visit, the conservators took the statues out of storage and began to clean them because they'd gotten a little dusty. And when Madame Zuin arrived, she was horrified. She said, you put them on the floor. Would you put Ho Chi Minh's image on the floor? And profound apologies ensued. There was some confusion. My colleagues understood that statues in temples are animated with gods. They also understood that the images that had been placed in their storeroom were not animated. They thought of them as just statues. Madame Zun was causing us to see that, that although they were not animated, they were more than just statues. A few years later, when we had the support of a grant for collaborative research from the Venner Grant Foundation, uh, Buti Tantam, Winti Tuhung, uh, researchers from the VME and I went back to the Tianhong Palace to explore the social lives of statues used in temples favored by spirit mediums in Vietnam's mother goddess religion. Ba Dong Zun and her husband, Ong Dong Duc, received us graciously. They welcomed the interest of scholars in their religion. They sent us to the carver and the lacquer maker who had made the VME statues. We found other carvers. We found other spirit mediums. This was the beginning of my education and the start of a comparative project that would begin in Vietnam, take me to Myanmar, take me back to those images above the Manchin's altar in Korea and to Bali. I approach this work through three affordances, three things in common that enable the work the images do. Birgit Meyer writing from the field of material religious studies calls for a deeper appreciation of the process of religious fabrication. And this is my first affordance a uh, most direct interest for a conversation about active matter, an affordance that spans what we might think of as the Catholic world, originating but no longer restricted to Europe, and the Hindu Buddhist world, places where religious images have long traditions of workshop production, where they have been commissioned as acts of conspicuous devotion and produced to a high level of skill where levels of material consumption enable standards and hierarchies of value with respect to materials and craft. Those who commission, install, and subsequently venerate sacred images are dependent on the good intentions of a process that has been entrusted to other hands. The ambiguities that attend transactions in potentially efficacious things are not unrelated to the relative speed with which decay might overtake and compromise an object that is the seat for a god. I heard this in Vietnam 
I would hear it again in Myanmar and Bali. But, and this is my second affordance, there is a significant difference between religious statues in the Catholic world and religious statues in the Hindu Buddhist world. Catholic images, sacramentals, inspire prayer, enable the reception of grace, but they are not or are not supposed to be idols. When they show signs of life, they are considered miraculous and or theologically problematic. In the Hindu Buddhist world, images are made to be inhabited by gods. In the slide here, you see the Vietnamese carver on the left preparing a cavity into which special matter, some see it as the equivalent of organs, is inserted by a ritual master, sealed, and the statue ritually enlivened. On the right, a ritual master seals the filled cavity in anticipation of the ritual enlivening and awakening of the statue's senses. These images are regarded as presences, consecrated and venerated through appropriate techniques and practices. Sacred, powerful, sometimes dangerous, and also material objects that will deteriorate over time even as the shaman's or the medium's body is subject to the vicissitudes of aging flesh. Wood rots and insects feast on it, stone crumbles, moss finds purchase in the pits and crevices, paper soils and frays, metal corrodes. The specter of decay links my discussion of sacred images in mother goddess temples in Vietnam, images of nut spirits used by Burmese spirit mediums and paintings of gods hung in shaman shrines in South Korea, as well as masks worn by mediums in Bali. The practitioners I described, no less than my colleagues who work in the conservation laboratory at the American Museum of Natural History, are not engaged in a quixotic effort to stop time. Rather, they make choices against the prospect of deterioration or address its consequences as best they can. In these places, the relative quality of materials, craftsmanship, and some practices we might cautiously and heuristically call magic are considered for the image's subsequent career as an ensouled and agentive thing. Those who commission, install, and subsequently venerate sacred images are dependent on the good intentions of a process that has been entrusted to other hands, to the master carver, to the workshop. The ambiguities that attend transactions in potentially efficacious things are sometimes not unrelated to the relative speed with which decay might overtake and compromise an object that is also the seat of a god. Oops. Hmm, and the screen is sticking. Ah, oh, wait a minute. There. The final affordance uh, for my four case studies is that under the very broad umbrella of sacred things in a larger Asian world, there are distinctive traditions of mediumship and shamanship that are aided and abetted by human engagement with images. And a mirroring and manifesting of things otherwise unseen happens with respect to both material things and human bodies, the God spirit or energy operating through the image to enable the work of the more mobile and articulate human agent. To be able to affect this work, what happens in the workshop is a matter of considerable consequence. This is Len Dong in Vietnam, Nat Poi in Myanmar, performed by a Nat Cho, Kut in Korea, performed by a Manchin, and in Bali, where the mask image covers and subsumes the identity of the medium. When my colleagues and I began our work in Vietnam, it was a very good moment to do this project. Under high socialism, there had been many acts of iconoclasm and consequences abducted to them from deaths to chronic arthritis, and more generally to Vietnam's pervasive poverty in the late 20th century. But the market was back, things were looking up, and there was a felt need to restore fallen statues 
and repair decaying temples. Wood carving workshops collectivized and transformed to other work during high socialism were back and booming. The material properties of things, Tim Ingold argues, are processual and relational. Things become active through the manner of their production, use, and eventual deterioration. Those who carve wood and those who laminate and paint on paper are entangled in this larger process of becoming and deterioration, both with respect to the nature of the materials they work, the texture and durability of different woods and stones, the relative tenacities of different papers and their capacity to receive ink from a brush, and the corporeal limitations of the producer's own body to engage tools and substances at hand. No pun intended. Ingold's work is part of a citation circle concerned with the dynamic properties of material substances and provoked by the philosophical work of Deleuze and Guattari, who ask, how can the cosmos and life within it exist in such a way that they are the result of change, yet also always susceptible to further change? This could be a natural a history question. It could be a statement of, of Taoist philosophy as well. Or as Ingold puts it, life is open-ended. Its impulse is not to reach a terminus, but to keep on going. Decay is a process of keeping on going, a sign of the vibrancy of matter, as when philosopher Jane Bennett writes that our trash is not away in landfills, but generating lively streams of chemicals and volatile winds of methane as we speak. Oh, a cheering thought that. Nor is vibrancy restricted to exclusively organic processes of growth or, and rot. Archaeologist Ian Hodder describes how even the hardest of inorganic solids change. Rocks erode into sands that are sorted and carried in water down to the seas. Archaeologists know, he says, that even obsidian is not inert. Its surface hydrates at a steady rate. To efficaciously house a god, the carving in Vietnam is expected to be exquisite, and the wood, fine-grained core wood, well-seasoned. Temple statues in Sondong village are carved from jackfruit or meat wood, which repels insects. It tastes bitter, we were told, a bit of ethnobotany deployed to avert or at least postpone the decidedly non-efficacious consequences of a statue infested with insects, a frequent enough occurrence with wood in Vietnam. In the most traditional workshops, the workshops favored by respected temple meat keepers like Ong Dong Duk, the wood is cut on a day and hour set by the lunar almanac after sending out any ghosts or infelicitous elements that might have taken up residence in old wood. And the carver who makes the first cut is endowed with a horoscope that syncs with the year, month, day, and hour of the cutting. The wood is cut to an auspicious measure on the scheme attributed to Luban, the Chinese god of carpentry. The master carver seeks a vision of his intended deity in his own mind's eye before he begins to carve. He makes his workers observe various workshop taboos, no bare chests, no inauspicious talk, no laundry hanging over the, over the statue, no menstruating women touching the statue, no dog meat consumed, no garlic or strong smelling herbs when the final gilding is applied. Offerings and petitions punctuate the entire process from the master carver's offerings to the goddess before going to discuss the commission with a potential patron to the patron's final inspection and request for the goddess's permission to accept the statue. In this process, it becomes difficult to parse the difference between strictly material processes and things done to a magically consequential end. Thus, it was in the carving workshops of the Red River Delta that two seemingly contradictory bodies of theory came together for me. The first was Alfred Gell's work, the notion that objects can be agented, that a powerful thing can be seen as causing something to happen, and this has social consequences. Cast the statues down from the altar, throw the statues in the pond, and bad things happen. 
be sloppy in the workshop, in work and in ritual, and there might be accidents or clients who fall short on paying the commission. And then, on the other hand, there is Ingold's radical materialism, intended to topple and supplant the idea of object agency. Thinking with and through the material properties of things is a productive move, but as I and others have noted, it is insufficient. Ingold's radical materialization does not account for some of the choices made by the human actors who produce and venerate sacred images, images intended to be agentive. These choices, deeply entangled with the material properties of sacred images, the skill of the maker in deploying them, and with the vibrant prospect of decay to be postponed insofar as possible, cannot be completely collapsed into pure chemistry and botany. Of course, not all images are equally efficacious, nor are they all made with the same care. A shopkeeper on Hanoi's Hanguat Street, a hive for these activities, described a hierarchy of value for religious statues. The least expensive and least efficacious images were produced for the market in rationalized workshops and sold directly off the dealer's shelf. Somewhat better statues could be commissioned through the shops and made to order for a higher fee. Finally, there were the statues made by a master carver using traditional proce uh, processes. And these, of course, were the most expensive. These were considered the most efficacious, the most ling. These were the sorts of statues that Ong Dong Duk had commissioned for the Vietnam Museum of Ethnology. Younger mediums who use the less expensive statues maintain that a statue is a statue, that the ritual master who installs a packet of precious materials and amulets inside the statue cavity and performs the appropriate ritual in dark midnight, brings the statue to life and makes it a responsive god. Other mediums associated with established temples consider these attitudes naive, if not dangerous, asserting that badly made statues are not ling, do not secure the mother goddess's favor, and will likely bring inauspicious consequences. I would find this kind of argument in other places. I want to note, when I speak about magic in Vietnam and in other places that I will be discussing, my subjects are no strangers to modern science. This is something else. The statue, like the communion host, is a material thing whose intended work overflows material logic. The specter of decay has a hand in this. A statue will be less efficacious, even inauspicious, where the carver substitutes cheap branch wood for more durable card wood, where improperly seasoned wood rots and becomes infested with insects, where the artisan skimps on the gold lacquer commissioned by the patron, or where the final product is ugly. If human beings do not punish the carver, the gods will, said one master carver, who described his own practice as doing the mother's work, doing the gods work. But however fine and careful the process, even well-made statues inevitably require repair and a fresh application of lacquer. In the new millennium, successful temple keepers were addressing the ravages that time enforced austerity and anti-superstition had imposed on the statues in their care. A temple keeper divined with a toss of coins that the deity was willing to temporarily leave the altar and the statue was deanimated in broad daylight as an inversion of its original midnight ensoulment, a midnight ensoulment that would be repeated after the repair. The deanimated statue was temporarily not a god, but it was something more than a block of carved wood, and statues sent out for repair traveled to and from the workshop under red cloths. Some shrine keepers, cautious of both shoddy work and possible sorcery, had the carver do the repairs in their own temples. It was a matter of debate whether these statues needed to be deanimated, and we heard both opinions from equally venerable sources. 
statues that have deteriorated beyond repair are deanimated and either cast into pure flowing water or burned and the ashes cast into the pure water. A final acknowledgement of the statue body as extraordinary matter. And now on to Myanmar. Myanmar is also in the Buddhist world, albeit they're Theravada Buddhists, not Mahayana Buddhists, and the ritual calendar is a different calendar. But from what I had read, images are also animated. Nut spirits are invested with the nut's butterfly soul and live in close association with spirit mediums who carefully tend them, bathe them, dress them. Note the arrangement in the basket. These statues are not piled one on top of the other as an economy of space and protection. Rather, they're set up so that they can look around, see what's going on during the journey to the temple. In Myanmar, I joined forces with Aaron Hazanoff, whom some of you know, former BGC AMNH postdoc, and with field assistants, Pipi Thant and Otete Win, to interview mediums and carvers. I wanted to see if the workshops that carved the medium small wooden images were both as attentive to magic and craft as their counterparts in Vietnam. In Myanmar, mediums carry their own images to rituals as their co-present enablers and to festivals in the Nats home temples where the little images are periodically irradiated by the Nats primary images. This is a more portable practice than that of spirit mediums in Vietnam who perform their Lendong rituals in front of the empowered and immobile statues of a major temple. Statues set in place by a ritual master and not to be moved. The little nuts are more likely to be banged and battered as recorded in ethnographies. When we spoke with statue carvers near the Mahamuni Pagoda in Mandalay and the Shwedagon Pagoda in Yangon, carvers were familiar with our questions. Yes, the carver should abstain from alcohol and work with a clean body and respectful attitude. Shoes removed is at a pagoda or monastery. Statues must be beautifully carved according to proper prototype. A ritual offering might mark the start of a large and important commission. And depending on the client's willingness to pay, a carver would observe different levels of Buddhist precept. But we soon realized that our interest in nut images was confusing to the carvers, who considered the nuts a sideline business, less significant than larger and more expensive Buddha images. When they described prohibitions and purifications, they referenced carving the Buddha for a major temple commission. In addition, the form of a Buddha image demanded strict adherence to precise protocols, while nut images needed only appro to approximate the gestures and costumes deployed by mediums. One carver told us that he felt happier when carving Buddha images than when he carved nuts because he could focus his mind on this work. The nuts, he said, could be rougher and cruder than a well-fashioned Buddha image. This seemed to be the nub of it, the relative roughness of the nut image and the relatively lesser concern for the conditions of its manufacture is appropriate to nutness relative to the refinement, purity, and overall quality of the Buddha image, objects for the medium's personal use rather than community veneration. This is not to deny a medium's pride in particularly good quality images and his or her ability to have them freshly gilded, but nuts are lowly beings relative to Buddhas in the Burmese scheme. Most nuts die violently through treachery or otherwise badly. In dying, they were unable to assume a prayerful orientation toward the next life, and so were denied reincarnation. Uh, as Burma scholars describe them, Nuts remain trapped in the emotions and appetites they wore when alive. Where good Buddhists work toward salvation by periodically following precepts, enjoining moral behavior, fasting, temperance, and other austerity, the nuts exemplify the appetites and failings of the flesh. 
in the stories told about them, the corporeal activities they enact via their mediums, and the rowdy and transgressive behaviors of roistering devotees on the periphery of the nut festival. Nuts have essentially human feeling and failings. Their anger is dangerous, but they also bestow aid and good fortune on devotees who please them, addressing a range of human concerns from illness to business, mundane issues that one might hesitate to impose on the transcendent Buddha. Not images decay more quickly than Buddha images. Old images are very hard to find. Wood is more likely to deteriorate when it has a wider grain and when it has been carefully seasoned and when it has been less carefully seasoned. And hardwoods are less appealing to insects than most softwoods. The smaller nut images might be carved out of remnant branch wood rather than more durable carved core wood, and nuts can even be made of plastic. It would be difficult at the time of our research to find a plastic Buddha image in Myanmar. The practice of carrying nut images to rituals and festivals would also take a toll. This is not an argument that nut images are necessarily shabby or that like some sacred objects in some traditions they are intended to decay, rather the accessibility and portability of these images, a reflection of the accessibility of the nuts who animate them. Acquisition is a personal rather than a temple community project, and these small and relatively inexpensive images circulate freely. Little nut are carefully tended by their mediums, dressed and quaffed in at least some cases with the medium's own hair. At the same time, the relatively inexpensive, small, portable images are of this world, to be dressed, to be bathed, to be primped, and where the nut desires it, lustrated with whiskey. If, like their human hosts, they are vulnerable to decay, for the duration of their gilded time upon the altar, they abide as an intimate presence. Now I was ready to go back to Korea and learn more about the images of gods that, I, that had been fighting and fell to the floor. By now I had also learned the pleasures of team research. And while I have usually been a solitary anthropologist in South Korea, this time I joined forces with Dr. Jong Sung Yang, a folklorist and Professor Yoon Yeol Su, an art historian, both of whom had interesting things to say about shaman paintings. Of course, we are talking now about, not about statue bodies, but about two-dimensional paintings on laminated paper and sometimes even cheap, garish, mechanically reproduced prints. When Manchin installed Buddha images on their altars, a relatively recent practice, they mimic Buddhist eye-opening rituals or hire monks to do this for them. In the Buddhist world, animation in the container of a statue body has a liturgical certainty so long as the procedures are carried out correctly. But when I asked how the gods enter the paintings, I encountered a certain vagueness. We cause the gods to be there, one Manchin said. And no, there is no special ritual for this. The gods do go into the paintings. The Manchin needs for them to be there in order to receive Myungi, bright inspiration, bright energy. And this is supposed to happen when the Manchin sees them in front of her eyes as part of the initiation ritual. And I realized that in fact, Diana Lee and I had captured such a moment on film. Thank <laughs> you. 
She says they're all here, and her spirit mother, her her teacher says, "Well, it really would have been a disaster if you'd gone all the way up there, and nothing had happened." Um, some mention, and the very few traditionalist painters who remain in South Korea consider the um, careful uh, preparation of paintings um, absolutely essential to the success of the Munchen's work. Um, just as some specialist workshops in Vietnam do, I interviewed two traditionalist painters who claimed that they sat with the Munchen and absorbed her vision of the deity in their mind's eye. They bathed and reported to the deities before beginning their work and reported again when they completed. They lived in monkish isolation and austerity for the duration of the commission, lest they encounter an accident or a quarrel, which would be inauspicious. Both painters could afford, um, and both, pa uh, both painters related wondrous tales of their engagements with gods and paintings. Munchen, who could afford their work, considered these paintings a mark of distinction and good practice. But in truth, most Munchen in South Korea today use paintings that are either produced in commercial workshops or cheap commercial prints. When pressed on this point, even Munchen, who are proud of their own traditionally produced paintings, will give primacy to the Munchen's connection with her gods, such that a Munchen with strong compatibility to her spirits can work by a commercial print or even a photograph. Not a fixed container like the statue, the painted image is also more fragile, more mutable. They become soiled with incense and candle smoke and are sometimes gnawed on by bugs and mice. Gods in the Munchen world prefer pure, clean things. When the Munchen can afford to replace them, the gods are politely asked to vacate the old paintings, dirty and tattered, which are taken down from the altar, burned and replaced with fresh new ones to welcome back the gods. While statues are tenderly repaired, the painting is, in effect, shed like old skin. Paintings from the shrine of a retiring Munchen would be buried with the rest of her paraphernalia in a mountain grave. We do this for people, so we do this for them too, a Munchen explained. The proper disposition of departed gods enacted through the medium of paintings rotting corpse-like in the ground. I wanted one more case to round out my discussion. It is said that if they are good, anthropologists get to go to Bali when they die. The attraction for me was a passage in Jane Bilo's book on trance in Bali, which I read in graduate school. She describes how one day in the 1930s, a powerful Rangda mask, like the one in this picture, was being carried back to Tagaltamu village. And as it passed, ordinary people were drawn from the field, drawn from the kitchen, and thrown into violent acts of ritual self-stabbing. So that, that was the paragraph that stayed with me. Now I needed a rationale. And my rationale for going to Bali was an interest in the contrast between how sacred things are produced and how similar seeming objects are produced for secular markets. Bali has been a tourist destination since the 1930s, and souvenir carvers have been active there ever since. Both the serious workshop protocols for making temple masks and the existence of knock-em-out workshop productions had already been noted in the literature. I thought no more than to ask my now standard questions and garner some firsthand interviews. Dr. Wayan Ariati, a Balinese religious historian has been my happy partner in this work. The carvers were receptive as they have been to many scholars. They spoke of work undertaken after a ritual purification 
work done in a near meditative state in a clean and quiet place and of the sincere days of meditative prayer undertaken by the community in anticipation of this work. They describe the importance of the wood of a pule tree that grows near a cemetery, but not just any pule tree. It would have been a tree struck by lightning or the priest would have had a vision of light descending into one of the bumps on the tree, a bump that would be ceremoniously extracted to make the mask. The accompanying ritual of taking the, extracting the bump involves work so dangerous, such a dealing with dangerous power that priests had been known to die as a consequence of, of performing this work. One carver described a mask that had been infested with bugs shortly after its installation, a circumstance he attributed to conflicts and insufficient resolve in the community when they commissioned the mask. Decay as a moral as well as a material condition. I learned about the social life of temple masks enlivened by powerful sesuhunan, tutelaries born on the heads of entranced mediums and also capable of throwing bystanders into trance in the work of transforming things demonic into things divine, at least for a while. Masks that when they were too old to be repaired were ceremonially cremated and their ashes cast, cast into the sea. Some familiar themes here. And then I heard something that really surprised me. The mask Ratu Gude Gambron, also known as Giro America. The story of the mask begins with a curio. Some say not even a very good mask, a mask gifted to a foreigner who took it abroad to New York, to Canada, accounts conflict, folklore is like that, where it rattled in the night and terrified the children and some say it flew around the room. It was returned to Bali and hung as a decorative piece in the residence of the former rulers of Ubud. Strange things continued to happen, door slamming, nocturnal sightings, a flying mask and more until a psychic confirmed that the well-traveled Giro America came back to Bali to protect the people of Ubud and the mask was installed as a proper temple mask. During temple festivals, Giro America appears and causes his medium to sprint extended courses around and beyond the town of Ubud, spotting practitioners of witchcraft. This is the work of a proper sesuhunan, a proper tutelary, but Giro America is also eccentric. Masks made as curios are not supposed to behave this way. Masks in the face of Cheluluk, a comic old woman and not a god, are not supposed to behave this way. And Giro America's extended courses around and beyond greater Ubud, sometimes lasting until seven in the morning, are regarded as remarkable feats even for a sesuhunan on patrol. A few other initially secular masks also turned out to be eccentrically empowered. If we had more time, I would tell you about them. And some others have also come back from abroad after behaving strangely, but none have yet masked Giro America's renown in perennial human interest news copy, a brief and spooky made for TV film, Facebook commentary, and posts under the hashtag Ratu Gude Manik America. This Sesuhunan is indeed a media phenomenon. When I asked the carvers about Giro America, they parsed possible explanations, almost inevitably beginning with the wood. It might have been purchased in a commercial lot, but already invested with energizing light unbeknown to the carver. The carver and his tools may have been ritually purified for another commission. And the carver may have done the work in a meditative state because that's the kind of carver he is. And it is usually acknowledged that the invisible force energies, the niskala, might just simply have chosen to go to ground in the mask because the niskala can go like the Holy Ghost where the niskala want to go. This is very active matter. Indeed, the aim of this journey has not been to make a typology or to offer a particularly Asian interpretation, far from it. 
Rather, it is to present a wide ranging conversation enabled by some broad general principles about materiality and magic among mediums and shamans, carvers and painters in my four examples. As we move through them, things learned in one place could be productively upended in another domain of popular religious practice. Statue workshops in Vietnam introduced the idea of statue making as an unfolding of craftsmanship, protocol, and magic to produce an efficacious and agentive object, and with the specter of decay ever present in the mix. The Myanmar example offered a variation on the theme, um, but with the idea that materiality can be a relative thing. Um, and then in Korea, paper images counter to the gravitas of the statue container with a more ambiguous spirit presence that uh, witnesses the God's more fluid and dynamic relationship with the Manchin. Balinese carvers would see something of themselves in their Burmese and Vietnamese counterparts, but they work in a place where notions of wood as active matter take on another level of magnitude entirely. I leave you with the idea that insofar as decay um, is a process of becoming, as Ingold suggests, following decay can transport one to some unanticipated places in the study of material religion and maybe other things as well. I hope that is a cheering thought. And if you would like to read more about these cases that I've been describing, let me recommend the book. And there is a discount code. Thank you. Laurel, thank you so much. That was just absolutely fascinating and riveting. And one of the things I love most about it is your attention to particularities and how things differ from place to place. And the differences are as important as the similarities. Um, I was strongly reminded during your remarks of uh, something that pertains to an island just a little bit further west uh, from Bali, uh, Java, mm -hmm. where my mother was born. And thinking of, the, of Louis Coupiris's uh, remarkable novel from 1900, Distiller oh. Clark, The Hidden yep. Force. Oh, yes. The, <laughs> yes. the presence of, of, the, of spirits in that remarkable book. Still, uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, I want to invite uh, our panelists and to, uh, to ask any questions or make any points. And uh, I will call on anyone who has a point to make, Aaron. Thank you, thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Laurel, that was really, that was really great and so pertinent to, you know, things we're thinking about here. I tried. <laughs> you didn't have to try hard, it was very clear. It was, it was a lovely presentation. Um, I, I want, I'd like to ask you to go back to one of your opening anecdotes, actually, about the encounter, um, uh, with the uh, the Vietnamese medium and the and the conservators, yeah. and I, I really I appreciated you know in your sort of laying out of the affordances the sort of sense of distributed social network in which production use consumption um, uh, and ensoulment um, temporary deanimation uh, that's all and that sort of distributed nature. So I want to come back to the sort of museum practice. And can you talk either from your experiences in Asia or, or closer to home, either very close to home at AM and H or you know in other museums, in which um, in which those kinds of encounters between practitioners, whether they were medium mediums themselves or otherwise, um, have have changed uh, conservation protocols so that conservators are brought into that distributed network of care with these sort of new understandings, at least about the capacity of some of these images, even if they're in a temporary state of yeah. deanimation. Yeah, oh, of course. All right. I think you know how I'm going to answer that one. Um, 
first with respect to Vietnam, it was very eye-opening. The conservators, the, the statues came in with red cloths over them because when you transport something outside a temple, you know, you want to keep its energy and keep ghosts from going into that hollow cavity. And the, the medium was very upset that the conservators had stored the coverings as textile and treated the statues as statue object. The conservators have to think long and hard about how to deal with these things. And they were, in this case, it was their religion. They did believe in the mother goddess. And they did take very seriously what they were told. And after that, I think they were a lot more attentive to what you put on a high shelf and whether you cover it or not. Now, AM and H, as you know, I think, as we get ready for the Northwest Coast Hall, our cons conservation team had to deal with objects, some of which are considered empowered, shamanic, potentially dangerous, should not be touched by women, or maybe should not be touched by women for their own protection if they're a childbearing age. And so if you go to their lab, first there's a big sign on the door, like a trigger warning. There are empowered objects in this room used by shamans. They covered things that were considered powerful and put you know, warnings on them. And then they were given something called devil's club, which is a kind of protective herb, and they hung it from the rafters in the lab. Now, you know, did the conservators actually believe? I think they got to the kind of bisensate feeling that anthropologists often have, like this isn't my anthropology, but this is me now in the place. I'm, and, all of them felt they should do this out of respect for the object, for the culture. And it became the culture of that um, semi, you know, subsidiary lab that was working on the objects. And the people they were working with were telling them often, you don't have to do this, but we really appreciate that you, you know, because it doesn't apply to you, but we appreciate that you are. And I think this is the kind of road that we are walking down more and more in museum practice. The there's a, a longer discussion in the book in the final chapter about things in museums called afterlives and talks about how, you know, a lot has been written about the museum as a product of the enlightenment and things are treated, cataloged, stored as material objects. But we missed some really important information such as my colleagues in Vietnam went after with our sacred objects project. Let's find out what things still have spirits in them and, and what they discovered because they were recent acquisitions. The people who gave them had very carefully um, either gave them fresh new things or had ceremoniously removed the animated substance from the object. So, they, so then is it, so is it then accurate to think about the museum time as an afterlife or, or for some objects, is it still life? I mean, like for, ob for objects or, a you know, a different phase perhaps. I think it's fair. Well, well, I'm a kind of anthropologist who considers afterlife a phase. Right. I mean, I spend a lot of time talking to ancestors and rituals. Um, so I never, I, I didn't see that as a, as a hard break. Right. Um, but yes, I would say we are beginning to think in terms of the museum is not a, a full stop, an end of freezing, but a continuing story. And it's uh, the descendant communities and our engagement with them that's breathing the life back into the objects. That's fascinating. Uh, Peter has a question. Thank you, Laurel. It was wonderful. And I, uh, that, that uh, discount code flitted by too quickly. We should keep it up, uh, certainly okay. through the Q&A. Um, okay. I definitely want to read it. I thank you uh, very much for the efforts that you made to kind of talk to us. And in particular, you know, the prominence of the active matter at the end uh, was, of course, catnip. And I think a lot of people here are gonna be uh, thinking about questions. I have two that I'm gonna not formulate very carefully because in fact, I'm much more interested 
in the different ways you could answer it than in any particular one answer. So the first is I really want to think about for you the role of materials. I mean, I got the whole uh, Ingold uh, Bennett thing, but when you talked about at the end, wood and the Balinese masks, wood is a very particular kind of material that plays a big role in our active matter project. So I'm wondering exactly what wood means for you. But the second question still more broadly is, how, how have you come to feel that you as an anthropologist think about the activity of matter vis-a-vis -vis the conservators with whom you've been working on this? Oh, um, part of it is wishing I had another life to learn some of the things they know about how matter reacts. Secondly, I guess I was surprised to find a meeting ground between um, what they know, what they do, and the things I had to talk about. We've had some interesting conversations. Um, I don't know if that's that's a, a as fulsome an answer as you would want. I would say, yeah, it's been world opening. It's been op it opened my uh, my eyes to the work that happens in workshops. It opened my eyes to work that happens in the conservation lab. It also made me aware that you know that that to really do justice to all of these topics, it takes multiple lifetimes. There's so much I couldn't do in this book that I hope provokes other people to do. I mean, in the book, I give a, um, a kind of, um, oh, hypothetical. Imagine that all my carvers could talk to each other and I get them together in a Korean wine house and they swap notes the way I was in fact, in effect, making them swap notes. Um, they were, uh, you know, oh, do you have to be celibate? Yeah, we have to be celibate. You know, you don't drink while you're, we don't drink while we're carving. And then I get up and go out of the room to discreetly pay the bill in the restaurant. And, and one carver leans across the table and winks at the other and says, you guys really celibate when you're carving? Because those are the things I will never know. I could not, you know, by reasons of gender, by reasons of time, by reasons of, you know, all kinds of reasons, I, I, you know, craft secrets, trade secrets. All I know is the, is the nasty gossip that one carver tells about another. Thanks, Laurel. I wonder, I see you're getting your, uh, the slide with the details of the forthcoming book. Uh, yeah. and that would be great to show again so that everyone there can it take there it the is. Details Thank down. you for giving me that opportunity. Can you see it all or do I have to? Okay. No, this looks fine. This looks good. Um, so it's now we're just after time, uh, official time, but I know that there's, it's very likely that there will be numbers, if you're willing, Laurel, uh, I'm quite willing. <laughs> who would like to go on uh, discussing this extraordinary project with you. So I, as uh, Laura said at the beginning, unfortunately, I have to bow out myself, but I'm going to hand over uh, moderating duties to Professor Aaron Glass, who, so it stays within the AMNH uh, group, so to speak, since uh, both Aaron and I have the great privilege of being research associates in your division. So it's only appropriate that I should hand over to Aaron. But I'm just going to say in leaving, Laurel, thanks so much for this. And I'm going to be making use of that discount code, that's for sure. And thank you, Ivan. You're always such a gracious master of ceremonies. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. thanks, thanks, Ivan. And I'll just remind all the other people uh, on the call, you can either put a, um, a question in the Q&A um, or uh, in the chat and I'm monitoring them and can pass on the, the pass on the questions. Okay, well, we have a question here. Um, uh, which I'll read out from the Q&A. Thank you for the wonderful talk. When sacred objects were ritually deactivated, did you find a consensus among ritual specialists um, as well as believers about what can be reasonably done with the objects themselves? For example, are they discarded in a way that others can take them uh, to keep or take away? Do they ensure that they're taken out of circulation altogether, like being burned, et cetera? 
um, uh, is there disagreement among believers, specialists about what should be done, pro proper techniques of disposal, let's say. That was my sort of paraphrase. <laughs> no, that's a really good question. And I'm able to, to give some different examples to, uh, to that discussion in the book. As with so much else in this project, of course, there's a range of opinion. Um, in Vietnam, in Korea, in Myanmar, in Bali, things have turned up on the market. And there are questions of the proprieties that enabled that to happen. Um, did the rag and bone man who carted away the uh, paintings from the shrine of a dead shaman, the paintings no one else wanted to touch, um, did he really burn them as he was paid to do, or did he take them to the market? Um, did the uh, the statues from a temple uh, that were supposed to be buried, but did somebody sneak in in the dead of night and take them away uh, to the burgeoning antique market? Um, these things happen. Sometimes you get consequence stories, shouldn't have done that, bad things happened. Sometimes not. In the case of Korea, it got kind of overtaken. And it got overtaken in an interesting way. Uh, shamans have, were sometimes socially looked down on. These are women who dance and are bawdy in public. They're like prostitutes, uh, but they're not. And they're very sensitive to that. But then folklorist scholars started seeking them out and saying, no, you are the, uh, the receptacles of the ancient Korean religion. And they gained pride and they accepted a kind of cultural nationalist discourse. And the paintings fell into that. The paintings were sought. Um, occasionally, uh, oh, there are all sorts of different ways. Dealers going around and offering them a, a donation, a contribution, so that uh, which they can use to replace the painting with a nice clean one. But instead of burning it, let them take it away, which was a sort of new tradition, a violation of the idea that if there are two paintings, the gods get confused. Um, there are, there's the idea that paintings from a dead shaman, uh, if they're, if the gods don't indicate they go to another shaman, they get buried. And then there are people, known collectors, who some people in the shaman community tip off. They tell them where the grave is, so they might go and dig it up. So yes, it's, it's very complex. There is no consensus. Markets pull things, but they do not pull things absolutely. They do not pull so far that any trace of the sacred sense of the thing is gone. South Koreans now respect shaman paintings as traditional Korean art, but very few South Koreans want them in their home. Ditto if you are not a Burmese spirit medium. There are a lot of painters in Myanmar who paint nuts, but not for a Burmese audience because you don't want them in your home if you're not a medium. Great. We have a couple other questions coming in. Um, uh, this is from our colleague Meredith Lynn. Um, thank you so much, Laurel, for your fascinating talk. Uh, you might have mentioned this and I missed it. Have you encountered some kinds of decay or damage on any of the ritual objects you've studied that are considered to be positive, not in need of repair or restoration? So say signs of life, maybe. Signs of life? <laughs> That's interesting. Um, I can answer that in two different ways. Um, when a Balinese mask begins to emit sounds and go bump in the night, and people say, well, you know, maybe it's enlivened or maybe it's bugs. Um, my Balinese counterpart had that happen to a mask in her home. It was a mask that wasn't even carved by a Balinese. It was carved by one of her students in an exchange program. And her sister got very nervous and made her wrap it up and give it back to the student right away. She herself, uh, who accepts the power of Sesu Hunans, who is thoroughly in the Balinese, in Balinese ritual practice, but held the possibility that in this instance, it might have been bugs buzzing in the mask. Um, other, 
other instances, you know, there are lots and lots of traditions in Asia where things are expected to deteriorate, expected to decay in the flow of time. And then your, act, your ritual act is to begin everything anew by something, putting up something pure and fresh. In Chinese communities all over the world, the, you know, last month, people were taking down the red uh, couplets and putting up fresh new ones. Um, in Korean villages, I've written about this, well, there's a little bit about it in the book, people would put up guardian posts, village guardian posts, and they were not workshop car productions. They'd go, a bunch of guys would go on a lucky day up to the mountain, they'd whack a tree, and then they'd all dive at it with their knives and get this very attractively crude looking, um, you know, Koreans say, oh, Picasso didn't know our stuff, but he, of course he was influenced by us. And they were expected to stand for maybe three years and topple over and be continuously replenished. So that maybe the meta message is this continual cycling, this continual human capacity to work with these processes to make the world fresh. Excellent, thanks. I think we have time for one more answer at least, and I'm gonna combine the remaining two questions which are related on the production side of things. They both come from our students. So um, one says, um, Dr. Kendall, thank you for your fascinating talk. A quick general question, as the Vietnamese society is gradually modernized and becomes more market driven, I was wondering if the production process of the religious statues changes due to economic considerations. And sort of related question, not unique to Vietnam, is um, about the lives of the makers. How did they start making? Are there training programs? Um, is the profession, if that's the right word for it, does it require a family lineage or gender specificity? So it's a kind of um, a question about who, who gets to make these things and under what conditions, and if that's changing um, with commercialization. Yeah, okay, that's very good, very complex question. There's a lot about it in the book, but I'll do my best in the time that's available to us. Uh, the simple answer is yes. Everywhere I've written about, you can find evidence of rationalizing market practices. And, but counter to Bennyman, this is not, okay, so now we don't have sacred things anymore. It's um, a kind of spreading out what Bennyman also recognized that mechanical reproduction democratizes. It makes more things accessible to more people. In South, in South Korea, shamans would sometimes wait years in the past before they could afford paintings. They would put up simple slips of paper. When I did my research in the 70s in a in Korea that was still very poor, but everybody had images. They were just these cheap poster prints that looked very much like workshop paintings. And then in South Korea, the workshop system, of course, is very well established, rationalized production. And that means more shamans get more paintings sooner. In fact, people say that it, you know, it's one of the burdens of a poor initiate. She invests in her paintings and the ritual might not work because she can just barely afford it. And she goes for it. Uh, similarly, in Vietnam, I haven't heard this, but I sense it there were pictures, you know, sort of woodblock print paint, painted in of the deities. And you don't see them anymore, except where they're sold to tourists and sometimes they get the colors wrong. And I think the reason for that is that more mediums can afford these inexpensive rationalized workshop production images. But in all of these places, there is some debate. Well, in Bali, the carvers are, are master car There is between carving for temples and carving for perform secular performances, there's a, such a healthy market that the traditional carvers are in no trouble at all. Um, there are, and they just ignore the existence of rationalized workshops. I mean, you know, that, that, we just don't think about that. That can't exist. I was inside one, they do exist, but you know, I, I didn't hear too much about them. Thank you, I think we're just about at um, 
at 1.30 and we'll have to wrap up now. Um, but um, I'd like to invite my colleagues and those on the call who we can't see to um, join me in thanking you, Laurel, for your generous time and for the fantastic talk and stimulating talk. And we'll certainly be circling around with to, to you with these ideas um, as we move forward with, with our exhibit and um, as we all get to get the book in, in the spring. Okay, well, and thank you all. This has been great fun. Thank you again.